How many seven letter words can you think of that have N as the second to last letter? A little tricky, isn't it? But how many seven letter words can you think of that have I and G as the last three letters? You probably have a few more words coming to mind now, and if you don't give it much more thought, you might even think there are more words that end in ing than blank and blank. But here's the thing, that's not true at all. There are actually fewer words that end in ing. A lot fewer. Because ing words also have n as the second to last letter, but not the other way around. So you have words like falling, resting, and playing in both categories, but words like present, command, and examine are just in one. What just happened was a conjunction fallacy when someone falsely assumes a combination of events is more likely than just one of the events. In this case, one might assume the combination of an I here, an N here, and a G here is somehow more common than just an N here. And this doesn't just apply to abstract letter games. In one study, when given information about a fictitious patient and a list of possible symptoms to match, doctors generally thought a combination of conditions was more likely than just one of the two by itself. This, of course, would be a false assessment. Looking at this Venn diagram, it's clear that the combination of symptoms is just a smaller subset of one of the conditions by itself. As a general rule in statistics, the probability of a conjunction of events is always less than the probability of just one of the events. For instance, flipping heads twice in a row is less likely than flipping heads just once. If it's that obvious, why are we prone to making errors like misjudging letters or, more importantly, misdiagnosing patients? The most compelling answer lies in our use of heuristics small mental shortcuts we take to simplify our decision making. The availability heuristic, for example, involves judging something's frequency based on how quickly it comes to mind, or how available it is in your memory. It's why you can so quickly judge the popularity of a song based on how frequently you hear it on the radio. But it can also lead to misjudgments, like when we become hesitant of flights after seeing a plane crash gain coverage on the news, without knowing what actual plane crash statistics indicate. And in the case of the letter game from earlier, it's why we overestimate the frequency of the ing words we're familiar with from our grammar lessons about verbs. On the other hand, the representativeness heuristic involves judging probabilities based on how closely an instance matches our preconceptions of what we're judging. We identify characteristics that readily represent categories set in our head. A person smiling matches our preconception of someone friendly more than a person scowling. Snap judgments like these may help us avoid someone who wants to pick a fight, but this heuristic may also lead us astray. In the case of the diagnosis from earlier, the description may fit a doctor's understanding of dyspnea and hemiparesis, but probabilities don't add up in that way. Either one of the symptoms is more likely than the patient having both. So why does all of this matter? The conjunction fallacy occurs in all sorts of situations, not only in medicine, but in sports, gambling, and law. Pretty much any time judgments are being made about how likely or how frequent things are, there exists the risk of falling prey to the conjunction fallacy. While the heuristics that lead us there do help out in certain circumstances, sometimes logic is more appropriate than instinct. Drawing this distinction is what's most crucial.